Hey, welcome to uh, Positive Partners, uh, a dog show, and I'm here with Oliver and Tom, but this is Oliver, my Bernese Mountain Dog, and uh, this show is going to be about uh, loss or losing a pet. I had two of these guys, and uh, I thought it might be important because whenever you get a dog, cat, or whatever kind of pet, uh, you make a contract with the end and somehow. You know, whether it's uh, by accident or it's your choice. This is Ulrich. I lost him about a month ago. Another Bernese Mountain Dog, just a slight bit bigger than this one. But uh, his story started with, uh, you know, he was, let's see, seven years old, 11 months. And he had bloat, which is where the stomach twists and is a very serious condition. So we had emergency surgery for that. He came through that with flying colors and a week and a half later uh, developed some paralysis and he couldn't relieve himself and then his back leg stopped working and you know, led to us putting him down. So in dealing with that uh, I thought it'd be, it would be good to pass along some of the things that we experienced and learned from that. Uh, the first question is, uh, when do you put a dog down? This is, okay. So Tom's here. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so have you, have you lost a pet? Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. This is one thing that a lot of, uh, you know, vets, they get asked this question, when's the right time? You know, and most of the vets will just tell you, you'll know. Some of the, the key things is paralysis, can't stand or walk. And you can see with Oliver here and Ulrich, they're over 120 pounds. So carrying them in and out, you know, it's not a chihuahua. So if they're paralyzed, non-responsive to stimuli, uh, you know, they're not reacting to some so, to anything, refuses to eat or having diar bloody diarrhea, not, you don't want to do it if they're just vomiting or having diarrhea. This is blood and it's chronic. So this is a big problem. Uh, loss of bodily, bodily functions. functions. Lack of life in the eyes and just giving up. Uh, I saw that with Ulrich when... Uh, during that last day he was here. Mm -hmm. Usually he would run from people. He was a little fearful, you know, shy, I guess. Not necessarily fearful, but he was shy. He didn't care who was in the room. It didn't matter about any of this stuff. Uh, seizures, which are chronic seizures that can't be managed. Uh, bleeding from bodily orifices and head pressing, which you should do some... Uh, investigating on. This is Ulrich's last day. He's hooked up to an IV. This is at the vet's office. I apologize. It sounds like somebody's breathing heavy on my microphone. <laughs> That's Oliver. But anyway, along with, you know, you know, you know, you kind of feel it from the animal when they've given up and they, they have resigned themselves. Uh, one of the part of the decision is not being selfish. You know, you just can't bear to let go of them, and so you keep them around at their expense, and that's not good for them. Think about if you were in their shoes, not that they wear shoes, but in their paws, and you know, when would you would like to be relieved of the pain and suffering? You know, what kind of life are they leading? This is Ulrich on our front lawn which I spent like two or three hours with him sitting there just you know I fed him his last meal right there and that was our time okay so now you've made the decision you've gone through the doctor said whatever condition he has is not uh, you know he can't get over it so there's no cure and the quality of life has gone down one thing that I always do, I'm always there and trying to comfort them. They've been your best friend for years, you know, so the, you owe them to be there. You know, I know a lot, it's hard. A lot of people can't do it. 
another thing, okay, if you want to skip down to, uh, well, it's okay to cry, you're going to. And there's people, you know, that were in the room that didn't know Ulrich for, from anyone, and they were crying. So, back up to two, you pay the fees and make the arrangements for the aftercare, which is, you know, whether you're having buried or cremated or and all that. You make that do all that stuff beforehand because you are not going to be in any shape after you leave and you know you don't want to be in front of a whole room full of people looking a whole mess so uh, you take care of all that stuff and usually the the vets will have you like lead you out the back door or something so you don't embarrass yourself leave their collar on until afterwards uh, a lot of times collars mean baths or or something is going to happen. So leave it on till everything is, is finished. Uh, and make that special day uh, special. Give them treats, uh, have some special time. You know, if they're still able to do things, car ride, you know, take them to McDonald's, get some chicken nuggets or a hamburger or something. Have a good time and try and make it pleasurable as that time can be. Yeah, one of the vet techs said it's going to be one of, one of the worst days of your life, but it it is. It's doesn't doesn't it's have the worst to, doesn't have to be one of their worst, right? You know. So yeah. Okay. After they leave, you know, after they've been put down, and you've taken care of everything, you've gone home, and and that's another one of your dogs. Yeah, there. that's yeah. Riley. So you will probably see changes. They may be subtle, they may be large, and sometimes it takes a long time for them to get over it. They don't know what happened. Yeah, they're trying you, to figure it out. You yeah. went for a ride with this, you know, their buddy, and in Ulrich's case, that he was alpha dog, and he didn't come back. Yeah. And so... And if they, know, if they don't see his body, yeah. then they, they're trying to figure, put put the pieces together and right. you, you did some things that you were mentioning that you uh, created some more routines with your other dogs right and, you know kind of uh, we uh, went on the same walks we went to the park you know we show them that you know everything's okay nothing's going to happen to them I know when we took Riley my wife took him to go get some ice cream for himself, a special thing right? yeah, yeah by himself so he was real sheepish jumping in the car like, oh, no. <laughs> this, the other one disappeared. Well for the other this dog, is yeah. not going to be good. Yeah. So he was like really scared when he got into the car. And she made the first stop. It may, I can't remember where it was. They gave him some treats, and then they stopped at the, the ice cream place, and he settled down. I was like, okay, maybe this isn't going to turn out so bad. <laughs> Oliver here. Uh, go back to, the, to us. Oliver got real, or he still is, all of them have gotten real picky about drinking from the water bowl. And they really won't take anything else but uh, filtered water and cold filtered water. Mm. You know, before they weren't really that picky. Mm. He always liked to be outside and drink the water that had time to breathe. Mm -hmm. But he's gotten a lot more picky. But as you... You know, get into a routine and you pay attention to them. You know, Riley, the little brown dog, he's not a real, he's not like this guy where he likes to sit on your lap and be with you. He did jump up on the couch a lot more and, you know, he needed some comforting and knowing that everything's cool, right? Because they experience loss. Dogs have a full range of emotions. You know, they're not a thing of possession. They have the full range of emotions that people do. Yeah, that's right. Neuro neurologically, the structures that that activate emotions are there in mammals and dogs, and so they bond. Um, they're concerned about their the group that they're with, with whom they're bonded, and they grieve for the uh, uh, losses and, and that kind of thing. The advantage they have is they they live in the here and the na and the now. Right. Whereas they don't we, remember too much of yeah. what happened yesterday. Right. right. Yeah. For them, be here now is sort of the natural way of being, which is why we like them. I'm sure you're making a terrible sound on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Huh? You no, know, yeah. this guy, this is where he stays at home. He's right on the couch with me, and he's, 
He's been my shoulder, and I've been his shoulder through this whole thing. It's part of the reason he's here. Yeah. And this is Ulrich, and we chose to have him cremated, and that was probably about a $200, $250 charge. Part of it is the urn. That box there is the urn. And it does go by weight, so, you know, don't expect your Chihuahua to be $200. The box was probably, what, $80 or something like that? Probably. But, you know, if you have a, they'll do anything, a bird or... Whatever it is cat whatever and they're not going to be that much but these guys would take some work to yeah, to bury bigger yeah and my thing is i don't want to bury them in a yard that i may move out of right and i can you know take him with me or mm -hmm. whatever i'm not leaving him in in a stranger's place yeah and then depending on the time of the year and oh you know, yeah one's physical shape you know you can't necessarily yeah, it's been, the winter or if it's been 100 if it's, degrees, you don't want to wait and let them lay out there until right. you've got time or you can dig through the dirt that's hard as a rock or uh, August, icy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Where are you going, Oliver? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> May's getting hot. These guys get hot. So, Dad, it's the studio lights. There we go. You can lay down. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. you, I will. Okay, the, <laughs> didn't, didn't need your permission. So the, I'm good. So the yeah. microphone will be a little bit, yeah. you won't hear the heavy breathing now. Right. Right. <laughs> so, you know, through this whole process, it's been a rough month. And, you know, for a week and a half, it was just hard to eat. Our stomachs were tore up and, you know, just... In a way, it was good because it wasn't a long, drawn-out process. It wasn't like months of cancer and wait, withering away. You know, it was, you know, a day and a half, mm -hmm. and boom, your life's changed. Uh, and as you do things with them and enjoy life through their eyes, and, you know, both of you lean on each other, things get better, and... People, you know, I post on Facebook and, and people write things trying to come for you and, you know, sorry to say, it's appreciated, but it's, it doesn't take away the pain, you know, the... There's an empty place there. Right. It's like there by, you know. Right. Yeah. And nothing is going to make you feel better, you know, nothing. It just, ha it takes time. Yeah. We, we might go to the stages of grief slide. That'd probably be... Yeah. And you can prepare. You think you're prepared. You think you're ready for it. You're not ever ready for it. Whether it's a child, parent, human, aunt, uncle, grandfather, whatever. Pet, cat, dog, whatever. What makes losing a pet worse is you're making the decision sometimes. Yeah. And you're telling them, get in the car, let's take this last ride. Right. And that... That kills me, but it's it's very hard. But the the That's grief like like end of life kind of thing with a with a person, and when do you when do you pull life support? Yeah, that sort of thing. Or uh, a uh, uh, I've got a a uh, cousin who's an ER doc, and he said that uh, you know families say, well, do everything you can, uh, just don't don't spare any any effort and. Oh. And Don't yeah, spare any expenses. Well, or or how 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 extreme they will go through, mm -hmm. you know, the steps they'll go through to keep a person alive, and then he said, well, you know, he'll invite them back to the uh, the the room where they're doing all the heart stuff and all this sort of thing, and and when someone's illness is is chronic and irreversible and um, you know, predictably fatal, and the family sees what all their family member is having to go through, then, and they realize what, what all is involved, then they're more apt to say, no, no, let's just stop at this point. This is, right. you know, this is almost torturing right. somebody. It's, at, it's at the person or the pet's expense that you keep them hanging It on. can be that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, on the point of, uh, you know, being there with them, uh, a, um, I've got an acquaintance, and she, she mentioned a couple of them uh, that, yeah, we're okay with. Okay. Sages of grief, we're all right with that. Well, okay, either way. Uh, one was the, she, in uh, going through euthanasia with her, uh, 
with her pet, um, she uh, said that they, the, I guess the pet was dehydrated and they couldn't find a vein and it was awful and so forth. And uh, what she realized from all that, that it would have been better and what she did with her next pet was have a pre was have a sedative given. So she's, right. you know, and she spent about 20 minutes with that pet in the veterinarian's office. And they gave her that time. They weren't just, you know, looking over her shoulder, but she had the time there. And then if they did have trouble getting a vein and so forth, then that the, the pet wouldn't be frightened and traumatized. traumatized by it and so forth. So that worked out better. Um, and yeah, usually, every time I've had it done, with an animal, they have put them to sleep just as they were going to go in, in for an operation. Mm -hmm. And then they administer the drugs that right. you know, end life, however yeah. they do that. And when and someone else I talked to had said, well, they couldn't be there. It just was too heartbreaking. It is. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you're, you, you get the information about what is going to transpire, then maybe you can stay with them when they're when they are given the anesthetic. Yeah, they're still alive, but as far as the animal's concerned, they don't need you there for the the right. life-ending medication. But it would might be possible to stay there that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we'll go through the stages of grief. We'll go to that one here, and I'll I'll run through some information. Anyway, everybody grieves differently, and uh, you know, some people can can do well with moving on and just getting another pet. That that's fine. You know, you do what works for you. You know, you don't have to be a certain way. Um, if someone is is going through a whole whole series of grieving steps, they can go through shock and denial, pain and guilt. Uh, and that's a point where you're reliving all the things you wish you had done this, you wish you'd spent more time, you wish had you'd fed another uh, pet food. Yeah, like uh, whenever Ulrich went, I didn't know what what made these symptoms come What on. happened, yeah. Was he exposed to something? I mean, he was doing great after the surgery. Was he exposed to something on a, on a walk that we took? Or did I, you know, in trying to treat him better and giving him some better foods was there something in that or did he trip and so fall you, or so you question everything you could have possibly done anytime ever right yeah yeah and then uh you know there might be an anger and a bargaining kind of thing it's kind of like oh if i would have just done this and that's kind of part of that sort of trying to negotiate a different direction and and this is all a learning process is so what do you do the next time then there can be that stage, that that phase of feeling depressed and just kind of remembering, and then yeah, because like you know, one of those times when it comes up is when yeah. we go to feed. Right. I've got four dogs, and I and still have four four bowls. bowls. Yeah. Three dogs now, and yeah. four bowls on the yeah. floor. Or, and then the first well, there's a whole year in grief. There's usually a whole year of first time that happened, first time that happened, first time that happened. You know, holiday times and the empty plate at the table and, and so forth. Um, uh, then eventually you move on to acceptance and hope and, you know, being able to to uh, have another animal in your life, if that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I'll, I'll kind of go through this here. Um, I went to a, a uh, training workshop at the Boulder uh, uh, Colorado Humane Society, and and the presenter there said, asked the question, "What's the biggest problems with dog? Biggest problem with dogs?" And her answer was that they don't they don't live long enough. Um, and why is that? Well, they are genetically a subspecies of wolf. Emotionally, they're way different. They're more bonded, um, and we'll get to the bond part. Uh, but in terms of their their longevity, they inherit what, what the circumstances of a wolf, and a wolf lives a dangerous life in which they have to reach maturity and reproductive age relatively early because they are, they're, they're, nobody, nobody feeds them, and they are, are uh, preying on animals that can seriously injure them when they're trying to uh, take that animal down. So uh, that's, a, that's a bad thing. You know, I love big dogs. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the bad thing about having big dogs. The bigger they are, the shorter the, the right. lifespan. You yeah. know, you can have a little dog and they'll live 15, 20 years. Right. These guys, they, I think the average six to eight years. Yeah. That's just not enough time. Yeah. You it's know? just not enough. But those it's, are the best that's, years that's I've what, ever Yeah, had. right, right. But it, and you can be attached to a breed and that's, that's just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you love burners, you love dogs. Right. Um, Usually in, in the animal kingdom, larger animals live longer, but in dogs, it's kind of the opposite. We're talking about bonds and griefs. We are physically and biologically attached to our dogs. When we are with their dogs, we and they are producing oxytocin, and that is the same chemical that is occurring when a mother is with a baby, when people are with people who, with whom they're very, very close and so forth. So we have that, and you can track that that increase in in that bonding hormone and so when we don't have one of those animals when we lose them over a period of time or suddenly that flow of that sort of soothing bonding chemical is is stopped with that animal and we it's a it's a kind of withdrawal mm -hmm. um, so I have two of these guys right yeah that, <laughs> uh, that helps that helps yeah. and and for people who are sometimes you know, people are, are bonded to an animal, and that animal doesn't take the place of other, other uh, relationships, but it can count equally to, and sometimes for people who are lonely or isolated, that, that animal is their world. Um, now, when you get to the place where it's like, what do you do now? When a pet's terminally ill, we all have limits. There's only so much time we have, only so much energy we have, only so much money we have. And that's a place where you hopefully got to be accepting of yourself and understand that your pet would be accepting of you. Medical veterinary technology has become magnificent. And on the other hand, everything that can be done for a human being can be done for a pet. And, and, and I would stress, if you have a, you know, a big dog or a dog that is predisposed to cancer or hips or something, get insurance and get it early. You know, and just like with people, if there's a pre-existing condition, you're going to pay a lot for it. Yeah. So if you get one of these dogs that have problems, get that insurance early because it will pay off down the, in the long run. Because yeah. I think we had about $10,000 in all bills his total lifetime. Yeah. And that's just, that's just not feasible for many, many people. Right. And, and our pets, if they could speak, they would understand. So you want to have that kind of image of them being understanding of you. Um, when you are going through uh, thinking back on the loss of your pet, because we're bonded to them, because we, we are a social species just like they are, um, we will go to great lengths to try to take care of, to search for, to make, make things better for uh, any other person or animal with whom we're bonded. So in our minds, when after we've lost an animal, if we picture them as still suffering, as, as looking to us, and as us having failed them in some way, that tears at your heart. And what you can do uh, is, whether whatever you believe about what happens next and, you know, What's on the other side? What's on the other side? I hope there are animals, otherwise it's like, what, what's up with that? But anyway. Um, uh, what does help a lot is is picture in your mind those times when your animal was healthy and then picture uh, picture yourself you know maybe after your animals is is gone picture yourself touching them or something in such a way that you see them healing uh, getting restored to vitality running around in a in a in a in a field and and happy again because if you keep the image in your mind that your animal's hurting then you're going to feel like you are constantly having to do something so you want to get them pictured as being okay again and then that way they're free and you can let go and move on as well right and one one strange thing that happened after Ulrich left and we left the hospital we were outside and wife was smoke a cigarette there was a little fuzzy seed pod that went touched my arm and then went to the car mm. and 
there's been like four other times that that same type of thing, and I looked it up, and it's a thistle seed hmm. and floating around, and I've only seen like one at a time. Hmm. And that one time it was when I took them for a walk. Another time we were sitting in a restaurant, hmm. went over, came over and touched my wife, and when we left the hospital, it touched my arm and then went to the car. Wow. So I think that's him signaling that, you know. There are more cool. things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Yeah. And Oliver, you are great. Oliver. You're a star. Get up here, buddy. Let's say bye. <laughs> are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is Oliver, my burner, and uh, someday we'll have to say goodbye, and it will be hard, but yeah. it's worth it now. That's true. And you might notice I haven't tried to buddy up with Oliver because... Um, you know, he's, he's not my dog. He's Mike's dog. So uh, I just let him have things on his terms there and uh, worked out great.